And today I'm here with Nils Vinya from Glide Consulting. Nils, how's it going? Good, Brian. How you doing? Yeah, great to, great to uh, catch up with you. Doing good. So, um, so you've been running Glide Consulting. That's GlideConsultingLLC.com. Uh, you know, in a nutshell, before we go back to the story, why don't you tell us what is Glide and what is it today? Absolutely. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I've been running Glide for about two and a half years, or a little over two and a half years now. Um, and Glide Consulting is a customer success consulting firm. So I previously was a vice president of customer success and worked, I worked my way up from an individual contributor, CSM, to director, to VP, and then decided to go out on my own and help a lot of people with customer success. So I formed this firm um, in order to help SaaS businesses build world-class customer success teams that can reduce their churn by driving predictability through renewals and expansions with their clients. Awesome. So, um, so what's like a typical engagement? Like a SaaS company would basically come to you when they know they have a customer success problem or they plan to hire for that soon, but they need some guidance. Is that where they would come to you? Yeah, there's a couple of different scenarios and in, in the, you know, customer success is a very fast changing environment. And so my business has evolved over the last two and a half years too. Um, in the earliest days, it was about laying the foundation and I have a, you know, a hyper growth SaaS business. I need to get, make sure that after I raise my series A or after I raise my series B, that I'm going to be able to maintain, maintain my retention levels that are going to allow me to get the greatest uh, return on the next round of funding, whether it's B or C or whatever that is, right? So I got involved with a lot of very fast growing SaaS businesses, the likes of Segment, IO, Rainforest, QA, um, that were needed to get the nuts and bolts down and start working effectively with customers over the long term instead of just reacting to what was going on. Hmm. So that, that took up, that was probably the first couple of years where that was really the, the core focus. Um, and then it, in the last year or so, six to 12 months, it shifted a little bit where I'm now focused more on the training and enablement side for the CSMs um, in order to make them more effective at their jobs. So the leadership and customer success has evolved to the point where um, there are a lot of really good, high quality customer success leaders who have put in place programs across the board way more than when I was a VP way back in 2014, right? And so they've caught up to that point. Like where 2014 they, well, is like decades ago in internet. I know, it, it feels, it literally <laughs> feels like. <laughs> but they know what to put in place now, right? And mm -hmm. the, the nuts and bolts and the foundations, they're laying those, which is awesome. So I've had to evolve my business to continue to keep up with the needs, which is now more focused on the CSMs and training and enablement for them. Mm -hmm. Because as the, as the discipline of customer success grows, there aren't enough people out there that have been in the role of, as a CSM. So right. now you're finding more people coming from different disciplines, some from marketing, from product, from support, and they're coming in and they don't necessarily know or have direct experience with being a CSM. So my job is now working, partnering with these organizations that have solid foundations in order to train their CSMs to take them up to operate at a higher level. Got it. So, so yeah, so the, these companies already have the customer success people in place or they're getting them in place or they're being promoted from within uh, and you come in to kind of help them be more efficient and more effective at that role and really, right. really take it on. Yeah. They, cool. have, they have a lot of expertise in what they do. They're well set up with a lot of the processes that they run, right? So the need isn't so much on how do I run an effective CS organization. The need is I have this, what I have to run for all these customers and now I need this team of people to operate at the highest level possible to exceed expectations. Got it. So, so going back to 2014, you were doing that role for, for yes. a company. Right. Um, what, can you talk about that transition of, of leaving that company and going out on your own and deciding that this, there is a consultancy here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, all of 2014 was an incredible year where I joined as the VP early in the year. This company was early stage, um, had signed a lot of new clients and didn't quite know what to do with them. They had a you know a relatively small book of business, but they knew that they had to have a strong focus on customer success. So I came on board, and one of the first executive team meetings I was in uh, we, was delivered the the latest net promoter score results from the survey from the prior quarter. 
And this was net promoter score at the time was something this company had valued tremendously highly and was part of my bonus compensation package because they knew that the CS leader would have to drive this, et cetera. So one of the first executive team meetings came in um, was, hey, here's our result from our NPS. It's the lowest in our company history. And I was like, wow, sweet. <laughs> this sounds awesome. So over the course of the year, we put in place the foundation for CS from scratch. And we, by the end of the year when I left, we had gone from the lowest NPS in the company history to the highest, as well as we had zero dollars in expansion from our existing accounts. And at the end of Q4 that year, 14% uh, of our ending Q4 ARR came from expansion from existing accounts. Wow. So we had massive wins across the board. And essentially, I worked myself out of my job. Yeah. Right. I'm, I'm just curious. I mean, before we yeah. move on, though, I'm just curious. Like, what were some of kind of like the low hanging fruit or things that you were able to implement that that just really moved the needle? There's a couple of foundational elements, and this was kind of the core focus in the first couple of years of the consulting side to a great customer success foundation. Number one is an annual life cycle, right? So you got to know where your customers when they sign on, where you're going to take them to because you're in charge. The customer is not in charge. They're looking to you for your guidance, your expertise. You've done this 10, 20, hundreds of times, doesn't matter. They want to know you know where to go, right? They're going to influence all the pieces along the process and what's specific to them, but ultimately you have to take them on this adventure and you are the guy, right? So key components of that annual life cycle being defined are your onboarding process, which is your greatest chance to set expectations for how you're going to interact, not only in the beginning, but also throughout the rest of the year. And then the second, another piece is the QBR piece or some form of business review that acts as a guidepost along that annual life cycle journey to know where, how far or how close or how far off you are from your target of where you know you need the customer to go, mm -hmm. right? So without those, those were the things we put in place. And those were the things that allowed me to remove all the unknowns from our accounts and every quarter we did our QBRs with our customers and we learned more and we removed more unknowns. Ultimately, by the end, we knew exactly where we stood with everybody. Everybody else knew where we stood and we had concrete plans of what we were doing with every single customer. So essentially, we eliminated all the fires that typically come up. Nice. So, so you had all those big wins during your, during your time there and you kind of worked yourself out of a job. Yeah. How did you know like, it, was, it was kind of ready to move on? I was literally bored. I was searching for things to do, and I took on a couple of other um, responsibilities uh, in within the organization that really didn't have anything to do with my strengths. And I took a look at that, and I was like, "Well, yeah, I could technically spend time here because I now have time. However, this isn't a good use of my time. Right? Mm -hmm. This isn't the right thing for me to focus on." Yeah. So I had a very honest conversation with the CEO, and we sat down, and, and I said, "Look, you don't need me here anymore." Um, one of my CSMs can take over running the team because we've got things running on rails and then they can have a next leadership opportunity in their career progression. Because with me here, they're not going anywhere, we're a relatively small team. But they have, could have another um, opportunity to grow and then they could build on top of what the foundation that we built and I figured that felt like an enormous win and uh, I was excited by, by that, by leaving it that, on that note. Awesome. So, so you went out on your own at that at that point, rather than just going to it like another company and doing it again. Yeah, uh, that's right. I uh, <clears throat> this was a decision went around for I don't know a week or two um, around Thanksgiving time towards the end of that year, and I was and I said, well, yeah, I could go be a VP of CS at another SaaS business, do the exact same thing, and I was like, that was fun. We had some good wins, but I was always had a challenge that. I could only affect it directly and spend as much time as I could with my team, right? And that was usually relatively small compared to the universe of the customer success world at the time, which even was pretty small, right? But I wanted to have exposure and have relationships and influence lots and lots and lots of teams, way more than I could if I was a full-time VP. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was a big driver in the decision was, well, I could go get another job, but I'd rather go out and help lots of people. I've had some tremendous success. I've had some great wins. And I am 100% dedicated and passionate about the area of customer success. So once I got over that hurdle, then uh, then I was ready to go out on my own. Awesome. So so when you started up uh, your consultancy, you know, Glide Consulting, did, did you, and I'm wondering kind of what, 
what it is today as well. But like, did you always set out for it to be you driving most of the work and strategy and hands on with every customer? Or did you kind of intend to grow it into like a, like a scalable team working under you and, and, and that sort of thing? At the, at the time, and, and this is still true, um, I had a heavy focus on being just me, not building a team. And my, I love being a manager. I'm also a professional coach, and I love working with clients. And I wanted to do that for on a, you know, on a on a per hire basis, as opposed to with a team. So I never really wanted to build a big team. I wanted to build a business that was directly related to my strengths and where I know I can be successful and add value to clients. And that was as a result, that's just a lot of fun. So I was like, number one was I'm going to do projects and work with people that are aligned with my strengths and where I can have a lot of fun. And that was kind of the key to um, getting those first couple projects on board was I had to know exactly what it is I wanted to do. And that was the goal was just keep signing project, one project after the next, after the next, and iterating as, as we went. Yeah. So I'm, I'm kind of curious. I mean, I, I do want to hear about how you landed the very first few clients. But mm-hmm. I mean, it, this seems like a very niche consultancy. Like, were, mm-hmm. are there other independent consultants out there sp- focusing specifically on customer success? Or if there weren't, like, how did you know that that's a viable consulting path? At the time, uh, there weren't. Uh, I was, there was a first cohort of maybe two to three of us that were legitimate CS leaders before that had the ability to go out and offer our services on a consulting basis, but it did not exist. I literally was, if not the first one of the first two or three Mm -hmm. um, in that timing. And I met several of them um, around that time, had known one of them before, et cetera. Um, But there's a couple of us. And now the, the field has grown two and a half years later, field has grown to, you know, there's probably, I don't know, 10 or 12, maybe. And they all, everybody has gotten into slightly different areas. Some focus more on customer experience, some focus more on customer support, some focus on customer success. So the market has definitely grown and the other consultants have, other consultants have gotten into play. Um, but at the time when I went out, there was zero, there literally was nothing. And my, you know, my guiding force was around, I have no idea the projects I'm going to do. I don't know who I'm going to work with, but if I focus on what I am most talented to do, which I had a very solid understanding of, I know that I will be successful and I love customer success teams. So let me go see if I can talk to my friends and, and find out <laughs> some projects that we could work on together. Yeah, cool. So what was like the, what were your like very first steps? Like you're out on your own or you're planning to go out on your own. How are you starting that network and getting, getting your first clients? Yeah, so I, I was very fortunate in that I had a very strong network of CS leaders in San Francisco having been in the CS space as an individual team lead director, VP for the prior several years. Um, so I leveraged that network heavily. And in December of that year, after I made the decision early December to leave, I had about a month transition time and I was going to be officially on my own January 1st. And I hit, hit the streets and I went and met with every single person I knew in San Francisco, told them about what I did at Jana, told them about what I was planning to do. Just, just, got the word out there and that was where the original first couple projects came from was awareness of a hey, Nelson's doing this kind of thing. Oh, we've got a, a couple, two of them came in January and they were just a perfect fit um, based on time. And I had the expertise and I needed to plug me in and I was like, that's exactly where I want to be. That's all I want to do and get plugged into that problem, help you solve it. And then I'll move on and go on to the next one. Awesome. Are you able to share like uh, how you're, pricing works or how the model works like when you like what a typical engagement looks like uh, so, well, like how, how it looked yeah. back then and maybe how it is today yeah it's 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 evolved constantly um, I won't say anything specific because there is no one cookie cutter approach mm-hmm. I've always been of the mindset that my sole purpose is making sure that I deliver value and the right level of expertise and the right level of engagement at the right time for the clients So in an early stage company, that involves a whole set of activities around the annual life cycle definition, onboarding, QBR, et cetera. In the later stage companies who already have that, it's more around the training, right, and enablement piece. So every um, opportunity I got involved with literally looked different, and that was totally fine for me because it was a lot of variety 
in a lot of different ways that could help people. Um, so I go through a kind of a just, you know, assessment and evaluation process, understanding where people are, you know, position a couple options or ideas, and we figure out if there's one problem that I could solve right now, what is that? And then we work on the structure and pricing and stuff after that. Got it. Very cool. Um, and so you just kind of like, you know, looking through your, your website today, um, I'm, I'm seeing like a mix of the consulting services, some in-person training stuff, and then, uh, some self-paced training. Like, is that, is that more like passive, uh, kind of online training? Yes. Uh, so the program I built is called CSM time mastery mm -hmm. and, uh, a little over a year ago, it took, we had done a bunch of surveying of customer success managers and customer success leaders and trying to find out, you know, what was the most biggest pain point that they had in order to try to figure, for us to figure out how could we help solve it. Um, and time management kept coming, kept coming up and was always in the top of the discussion. And it was something that I struggled with myself tremendously as a CSM. Like when you're a CSM, you have many, many, many different bosses. You have your clients, and whether you have 20, 30, 50 of them, they're all individual kind of bosses. Whether you, And then you have your internal bosses, and then you have your executives, and then you have the product team, the marketing team, the support team, everybody you have to interact with. So managing your time and controlling that is one of the most difficult things in customer success. So I decided to um, come up with a solution that I could help lots of people with on a you know easy-to-access basis. So I created the online course, CSM Time Mastery, um, and this course over the course of four weeks takes you through a series of videos and exercises where I stair step you through the structure needed in order to master your time once and for all. Specifically targeted customer success managers. These are the people I know. This is a situation I've been in. I got some help from some people who are world class in their time management and it made an incredible difference for me. So then I took that and said, okay, I got to figure out how this applies to CS. And then I built the course off of that. Very nice. And it, and it helps you kind of like scale your product offering to have like the, the in-person stuff at the higher end and, and a more uh, passive or self-serve kind of option. That's right. Nice. Right. So, yeah. um, so, you know, uh, I guess before you had the self-serve uh, option there, it's, it's all consulting. And the thing with most consultancies is that they don't, especially when it's a, a solo person, they don't need that many clients at any given time to, to make it work. Um, so from a marketing standpoint, like how did you, how, how did you a, approach it early on? Like I, obviously you go to your network to get the very first clients, but then how do you start to branch out from there in terms of ramping up the, the lead flow? Yeah. So this was a, a very big learning experience for me in the, in the first like six months or so of consulting. Um, I had landed several great projects, three or I think I worked on three or four in that first six months, had by the end of the first half of the year had made almost my entire salary from the previous year as the VP. And I was going, wow, this is awesome, right? But then what happens? The immediacy dies off because I wasn't doing any um, fundamental like sales activities because that wasn't, aside from what I did in the beginning of going out and talking to everybody, it wasn't something I was continuously doing, mm -hmm. right? So um, I, at the time, Fortunately, hooked up with a business partner who had an incredible background in content marketing. And I knew about content marketing, had been involved with prior firms that were that was a focus, but I had never put a strategy into place or actually put anything in place. So when we joined forces, his primary focus was to build our 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 a flow of newsletter and, and subscriber followers to our content and then produce content that would ultimately you know, position us as experts in the industry and be a long-term content marketing strategy. So he did a fantastic job of that over the course of a year. And then he had some other priorities with another business he was running. And so he had the split and it's back to me just being by myself. So when that split happened, I took a look and I was like, okay, we, I had a guy who was focused hundred percent on content marketing. That's awesome. And now he's gone. Right. What am I supposed to do? Right. <laughs> and that was the time that you and I got connected and we got on the phone and you showed me a couple slides on the deck and I was like, you, and he said, I think you said, you know, that you're the line about um, that founders shouldn't be bloggers. Yeah. And I was like, <laughs> I, I, you're speaking to me right now. Take my credit card, sign me up. I need help now. Yeah. Right. So I was committed because so much new business from people outside of my network had come over the course of the, the in the second year and the third year. 
as a result of the content we had produced. And I knew that that was a really important long-term strategy. So when we got hooked up, um, then the audience ops team, you know, came through and started delivering weekly um, blog posts uh, for me with my, you know, input and insight on the on the agenda, the schedule, the calendar, all those pieces. So that was extremely helpful, and that is I've continued to do for a long period of time, in order to, you know, still serve the CS community. And I still get comments every week from people saying how wonderful the content is and how much they appreciate it. That's awesome. Yeah, that, that's awesome to hear. And, and um, you know, that like the founder shouldn't blog line. Mm-hmm. Everybody says that. Like that's that's just the, that's just, that just really cool, resonates. Man. It resonated yeah. with me too. And I'm not gonna take credit for coming up with it. I actually heard it. The first time I heard that line was mentioned in the Tropical MBA podcast. Uh. Um, they were just talking about like, you know, Blogging is something that founders should not be doing. They they they, yeah. they need to be focused on other things, and, nice. and that just nice. kind of resonated with me ever since. That's uh, awesome. It so, works. Yeah. Uh, so, so that I mean, I remember when you and I kind of hooked up and 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 you started working with audience ops. But I'm curious about the year before that when you had content up and mm-hmm. running. Like, what was it that made you, um, kind of trust that content is working and that it's still worth pursuing after that first year of doing it yeah we, the growth that we had we started the newsletter list in like i think mid-summer of 2015 or so something like that and um so my business partner was responsible for that whole piece and getting it running and he was responsible for getting the content produced and we had a number of different um ways in which we did that experimented with different services different people all those things while I was out selling the consulting and delivering consulting, he was focused on that, so it was good. Um, the way we, we got through to people was by being crispy and tactical and specific. So there was a fair amount of content in the customer success space at the time where the focus was, it was a little bit higher level. There was a lot of theory, a lot of um, what you should do as a, at a high level from a customer success perspective. But where we decided to cut through the clutter was around being just talking directly to the person in the seat, whether you're a CSM, a director, or a VP, and giving you very, very specific tactical advice that would just blow your mind compared to the other stuff that you read, right? And that's what we continuously get, got and continue to get more examples of that and and responses and feedback from you know, your stuff is some of the best because it is so, it's my situation. You read my mind, right? right? You heard that. So we put so much effort into being, cutting through the clutter by just being as tactical and crispy as possible so that people could put it in place right away. So what we had was CSMs would read it, love it. They would send the articles to their directors or VPs. And then eventually down the line, when there came up a need for some help from the outside, then they would reach out to us. And we had a lot of business come in as a result of that. So we built the trust with the people doing the work. And then when an opportunity arose, boom, we were top of mind and ready to come in. So that, I knew that that was a, a solid strategy and that's what I wanted to continue. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, just two kind of nuggets there that, that just I, I picked up. I mean, and I hear again and again in these interviews is that um, it is a, it really all about the research piece and understanding your target customer and getting inside their heads. I mean, that's that's a classic, strategy when it comes to just copywriting, like marketing, copywriting for the homepage and whatnot and ads, but even maybe even more so when it comes to educational content, like articles, lead magnets, um, yep, that's like right. just to really understand the actual challenges and the questions that they have in their work and in, and in their goals um, to make it worthwhile for them to actually open an email and, and download stuff. And yeah, um, that's right. I got a, an email just this morning uh, from somebody who, uh, there's a sequence of emails I send out when I open the Time Mastery course, again, who said, man, this email is phenomenal. How did you, like, what uh, copywriting or content strategies have you read and books do you recommend? Like, you, you speak so clearly. And I told him, I was like, well, I was fortunate in the fact that I was speaking to myself from several years ago. Right. And I know exactly what it's like in that seat, right? If I wasn't in that seat, it'd be pretty darn difficult. But I was able to write that particular email relatively easily because I was just talking to my former self who was in a state where I couldn't do anything with regards to time. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, the other thing that keeps coming up is is this idea that 
Um, and people who come in contact with you, who come into your orbit today, most of them are not ready to buy or, or to hire you today, right? That's right. Uh, they, they're just, they need, first of all, they need to build trust, but second of all, they're probably just not in a place in their business where they're yeah. ready. So um, being able to come back to their inbox and follow up over a long period of time and stay top of mind, it, it's so key. Yeah, especially with a consulting business where like, nobody hits in a sudden one day and says, oh, I need a consultant, right? It's, it just organically has to build over time. And if you're present with the right content and add value first before you ever even connect with them or ever even speak with them, they already trust you before you ever get on the phone. They feel like they've known you for years by the time you actually get on the phone and they do reach out and have, have something you can help with. Absolutely. So, so I mean, you know, we've, we've been working together for a long time. That the, the team here has been working with you, and you've been absolutely great at giving really um, constructive feedback and, and input, in, especially early on, but also ongoing. Um, can you talk a bit about that, like, like the workflow when it comes to content? So you as the founder, you know, not writing the content yourself and not even yeah. coming up with the ideas for the calendar, um, how any kind of like tips to other founders for for really getting that message and the research really nailed down when you're not the one actually writing it? Uh, it's all in the front loading of the personas and the target audience that you want to reach. So fortunately, my business partner he had done a ton of work and with me as well, but he was primarily responsible for creating it <coughs> on the personas of who we were talking to. So there was a CSM individual contributor level, there was a manager of a team, there was a director, and there was a VP, and we had very specific criteria of the pains that each of these people face on a day-to-day -day basis, and suggestions for the types of things that would help them in their job. And again, benefiting from my experience, having been in each one of those roles, I was very able to you know, articulate what a lot of the challenges were, and then we did, he did a bunch of other interviews and research and stuff. So when we started working with you, the first thing I turned over was this massive Google Doc that had a detailed persona breakdown. And I think one of your writers was like, oh my God, this is wonderful. I wish all my clients uh, could, could provide this to me. It's true. <laughs> and and, that, and I, I, I think that, that is what enabled you guys to get, one, up, to, up and running so fast, and two, um, I read most of the articles and most times I'd be reading through it and I'd be like, that's exactly what I would say. Right, so you were, you were in my head, knowing my audience, and had consumed and seen my content before, and you guys got to know me so well that I felt completely comfortable scanning through reading um, when, the, when the drafts were sent, uh, sent over, and I many, many times each week I would sit there and go, man, how do you get that? That's exactly what I would say, or that's a really good way to say that point, and I would totally say that if I was talking to somebody. That's, that's awesome to hear, and, and I mean, um, you know, the kind of the misconception when working with writers, r like really great writers, is that, you know, really great writers, like technically great at writing, like they can structure yep. sentences and paragraphs in a compelling way, sure. But I think their real strength is in their research and their ability to empathize with the target audience and, and really get inside their head and then really to learn it over a long period of time. So yeah. That's, uh, that's absolutely right. So the company I was a VP of CS for, um, we had a content-based product that was built to enable new managers in order to be great managers. So it was all about educating people on management, and it was pretty much 99% written content, very few videos sprinkled here and there, but it was all written. And our <clears throat> they, people would ask us all the time, like, who writes your articles? We had professional writers and professional researchers. Mm -hmm. And they were like, have they ever been managers? And like, not in these direct situations, but their ability as researchers to go out and understand what's really going on and then write effectively to that audience was phenomenal. And that was the only thing the company produced was content written by professional writers and researchers. And that, you know, was what I experienced with you guys, like the research that was done and then the quality of writing and the target of my audience just made it easy for me to, you know, know that that side was taken care of and I was going to keep putting great content and keep getting new people to sign up yeah. to want to see more. Awesome. So, uh, so today, I mean, here we are, you know, middle of 2017, um, Glide Consulting, you know, continues to do well. Where, where are things going, you know, the rest of this year, next year? What, what are you looking ahead to? 
So as I mentioned before, the, the shift in my business is, uh, there's a big shift towards the um, training and enablement for the CS organizations. So that's where I'm you know, making more of an effort towards it. I want to partner with these CS organizations who have the VPs, who have directors and have teams, and basically create you know, custom training and enablement plans based around the material that they're already supposed to deliver to con- clients. Right. QBRs, you know, executive business reviews, onboardings, lifecycle. They already have all these pieces, but there are opportunities for improvement and growth for each of those CSMs. That's what I want to be there to do. That's what I love, interacting one-on-one with people or one in a small group. Take them through situations where um, we role play and give them very specific in-the-moment feedback that can have a massive impact the next time they have a cu- they talk to a customer. So. Um, that is going to continue to happen on the in-person and kind of re- doing it remote um, over you know video conferences and stuff. And then I'm also going to make a concerted effort to build additional courses, much like my CSM Time Mastery course, um, around the skills that I know are are critical for success in the customer success field. Yeah, um, that is that is a continued area of, of focus for me, and it, it's my way to get my expertise out to a lot more people then could bring me on site or have interact with me. Sometimes it's just not feasible and that's fine, but I can offer ways to get access to that expertise, grow with me on a one-to-many scale. So that's what I'm doing. Love it. Awesome. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, the site, of course, is glideconsultingllc.com. And uh, Nils, where else can, can people connect with you? Yeah, LinkedIn is probably the best place. Uh, LinkedIn, you know, Nils, N-I-L-S, and Vinya, V as in Victor, I-N-J-E. There's really only one of me, or there might be a few others, but only one in customer success. Um, and Twitter, at Nils Vinya um, as well. Awesome. Well, this was great, Nils. Thanks. Yeah, thank you so much, Brian.